let me now welcome you guys to the first talk session of the conference. I would like to invite Professor Bapi Raju of Triple IT Hyderabad to chair the session. And I would also like to invite Mr. Nutaki Chaidanya Kumar from Amrita Mind Brain Center to co chair the session. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, yeah, let's uh, start the first. Yes. So maybe I, I'll uh, announce what it is, then you can. So the first one, uh, talk titled Positive, Not Negative Emotions, uh, Facilitate Response Inhibition by Shubham Pandey and Rashmi Gupta from IIT Bombay. Hello everyone, this is Shubham Pandey, currently a doctoral student at the uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay, Mumbai. Today I'll be presenting a part of my PhD work where I will show that positive emotions facilitate response inhibition under high level. So let's get started. So what response inhibition is? Simply speaking, response inhibition refers to our ability to inhibit, initiate, plan, prepotent responses. Any action or movement which we plan initially and then we try to cancel or suppress that movement falls under the uh, category of response inhibition. For example, here this child is trying to cross a road. So he has planned to cross a road and suddenly a car comes around from the corner. Now the child tried to stop himself. So this is known as response inhibition where we first plan something and then we try to suppress our initial plan. In the lab setting, this response inhibition has been studied with the help of a stop signal task. Here there are two kinds of trials. The majority trials, 70 for around 70% are known as go trials and then 30% are known as stop trials. On go trials, the participant makes a quick button press response based on the instructions. For example, here, the instruction could be that, okay, if the dot comes on the left side, then press the left arrow key. If it comes on the right side, press the right arrow key. This is the go task participant does on majority of trials. However, on some trials, after this go signal, the participant might see another signal. Here, you can see this red, stop hexagon uh, which instruct participant not to press any key and instead withhold their response now performance on this task has been explained with the help of a race model which hypothesizes uh, independent race between two uh, process go and stop process and whichever process reaches the activation threshold first that response is executed now the beauty of this model is that it gives a metric known as stop signal reaction time which is the uh, difference between mean correct go RT minus mean stop signal delay. Uh, recall that the stop signal delay is the delay between uh, the go signal and the stop signal. And this SSRT tells uh, that if SSRT is higher, then it tells that uh, there is a poor inhibition. However, if SSRT is lower, it signifies better inhibition. So the takeaway from this slide is this, uh, and we'll be using this in our further presentation. Now, coming to the current study, uh, we know now that the successful inhibition depends on attritional resource availability. Also, previous studies have used emotional stimuli in a stop signal task and have shown mixed results. However, none of the studies manipulated emotion and attention simultaneously. And that becomes the motivation of this study. Here we manipulate both attention and emotion simultaneously to study the role of, uh, role of attention and emotion in response inhibition. Now the literature suggests that high perceptual load lead to focused attention and uh, filters out distracting stimuli. However, the low perceptual load to spill, uh, load lead to spillover of, spillover of attention. So we hypothesize there is no effect of emotion in low load condition, but uh, a modulation by emotion in high load condition. We further hypothesized that this modulation would be such that the positive emotion will facilitate inhibitory control because the positive emotion takes less attention resources to be processed. Our task is similar to the X, uh, stop signal task we have shown here. Let's try to understand what is happening. In the low load condition, after the fixation, the participant sees a set of letters where the participant job is to find out whether there is a letter X or N present on the display. If the participant find X, then he presses the zero key. If he find N, then presses the two key. The participant does this on majority of trials. 
However, on some trials, like 30% trials here, the participants see the IFC match at the center. And it tells participant not to press any button. In the high load condition, uh, we make the go task a little bit difficult by uh, introducing five, six different letters here. You can see here that in the low load condition, all the remaining five letters were O, and it was easy for participant to search for X or N. However, in the low, high load condition, it becomes difficult for participant to search for X and N, and that is how we manipulate load here. The rest is same. Participant sees the IFC match and perform the task. Here is a trial uh, running. So you can see that these are the go trials, no stop signal, and this is the stop trial here. So that is how the participants perform the task. These are some usual details. The study was approved by ethics committee. A team of volunteers participated. Both positive and negative pictures are arousal matched. There were around 30% stop trials, 70% go trials. All the data processing and analysis was completed in MATLAB and statistical analysis was done in JASP. Let's see results. So we calculated stop signal reaction time here. And as you can see that first we found a main effect of emotion on SSRT. However, this main effect was driven by an interaction effect of load and emotion. And as you can see in the figure, there was a difference, significant difference between positive and negative uh, stop signal condition in high load condition. This was not present in the low load condition and suggested that positive emotion are having lesser SSRT. That means positive emotion were facilitating inhibitory control in high load condition. However, the IFCS images are very complex in nature. They have a lot of uh, uh, complexity, for example, color, and for example, uh, uh, the mutilated bodies are uh, heavily dominated by red color, blood color. So it is difficult to rule out alternative explanations and that is why we decided to run uh, the same experiment with more controlled stop signal condition, namely the grayscale faces. Now here everything is same except now that the stop signal is the grayscale faces. The faces were cropped in such a way that only face portion was visible without hair or neck. And that is how we control. We also introduced neutral faces here for better comparison and uh, 29 participants participated in this second experiment. The result, again, there was a main effect of emotion and that main effect was driven by an interaction effect of load and emotion. As you can see here, the happy stop signal here was having laser as a SRT compared to both angry as well as neutral. And thus it means the happy, SS, uh, happy stop signal facilitated response inhibition inhibitory control. These are some other, uh, these are the uh, details about result. And these are the other details about result which showed that our load manipulation was effective and the correct GoRT was significantly higher for high load condition. High load condition also yielded high discrimination error. It was true for the second experiment also discussing. The result consistently demonstrated an interaction effect of load and balance. In low load condition, both positive and negative stop signal led to almost similar inhibitory performance. However, in high load condition, positive emotion consistently facilitated, facilitated response inhibition compared to negative emotion. We argue that there is, in low load condition, there is an spillover of attentional resources by emotional stimuli, both kind of emotional stimuli. However, in high load condition, when emotional stimuli, uh, when the attentional, uh, when the attentional uh, resources are scarce, then positive emotion facilitated response inhibition. The explanation is that positive information takes less attentional resources to be processed, hence positive stop signal uh, can leave enough resources for a stop process leading to better inhibitory control. Uh, similar explanation is that positive emotions have a unique capacity to capture attention even in high load condition. 
Hence, a stop process with positive stop signal could easily capture attention leading to slowdown of ongoing motor plan. Limitations. Uh, the biggest limitation is that the sample is all male in experiment, experiment one and mostly male in experiment two. Although there are there is not any gross uh, uh, result reported, gender difference reported, gender might have influenced pattern of result. As a future research, it would be interesting to study totally irrelevant emotional stimuli in similar task. Any other suggestion, comments? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Shubham. Uh, this one question. We take one query. Uh, this is from Rocky. Please clarify about control conditions applied on this study for better comparison. Also, why this study is limited to 18 participants? Of course, why study limited to 18 participants? COVID situation, I guess. Yeah, please go ahead, Shubha. Thanks, Professor Bapi. So uh, as a uh, control condition, uh, in the first experiment, we had the IFs images, and then we realized that the IFs images have a lot of complexity. And uh, someone might argue that because of the color of the images, the result is uh, based on the color of the features of the images. So that is why in the second experiment, we decided to go ahead with the uh, faces. And the faces also the gray scale faces. We removed the hair, we removed uh, the neck area. So that is how we controlled it. Uh, and uh, other than that, uh, coming to participants. So uh, of course, uh, because of the COVID, uh, but at the same time, we uh, did G power analysis. So we found that uh, this number of participants would be sufficient to detect medium size effect. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Shubham. And uh, uh, this, uh, I guess one more question, but I think let us uh, move on. Uh, Thank you, Shubham. Thank you. The next presentation is uh, <clears throat> cross-cultural evaluation of emotional words on an Indian population. This is a recorded presentation from Himansh uh, and Priyanka Srivastava from IIIT Hyderabad. Good evening to everyone present here. I, Himansh Sharon, and my professor, Dr. Priyanka Srivastava, are here to present our work titled Cross-Cultural Evaluation of Effective and Concreteness Ratings. We belong to the Perception and Cognition Group from International Institute of Information Technology, Hyderabad. I would like to begin the presentation by talking about where it all began, the term which lays the groundwork for our research, emotion. So what is actually emotion? From a layman's point of view, the first thought that probably comes to mind is the pictorial representation of emotion like these emojis. As you see, each emoji depicts a particular type of facial expression, which we may map to a particular emotion. It might seem very easy to define emotion like this, but in reality, from a psychological point of view, emotion is a rather complex construct. By definition, emotions, also known as effective states, are regarded as complex, variable and contextual mental representation, which means that emotion is as a construct as a complex structure, which varies from person to person and from context to context. This means that a same person might show different emotions depending on his or her surroundings and context, and two people might react differently when presented with the same situation. It has been hypothesized by studies that humans break down the environment presented to them in components, acquire information, and along with the help of past experiences, form representations and formulate emotions. However, instead of this being a sequential process where what we think and what we feel leads to what we do, all these three processes depend on each other and simultaneously work together. Many studies make use of this relationship of behavior and emotion to understand the thought process of human brain. Simply put, the notion is that when shown stimuli depicting different emotions, what is the change in the behavior of a person and depending on what the behavior is, try to comprehend the mental representations of human brain. Now, this behavior can be a subjective one, like a person reacting to the situation, like he's feeling happy uh, when you like when you get a new job or a physiological one where a sudden change in the environment might lead to change in bodily responses, like increase heart rate or increase in body temperature or a behavioral one where response to a stimuli might be in the form of changing of facial expression. Now, in a normal setting, any stimuli can lead to an emotional response. However, in order to conduct a scientific study, we need a dedicated and controlled set of stimuli. 
This super stimuli can either be in the form of words or images presented to the participants. Data sets like IAPS for images and ANU for words have been created after taking responses from a large number of participants. These data sets take stimuli of different types and quantify them on the dimensions of valence and arousal. Now, since we have a quantified data, we can present this data to participants and measure the response. This response can also be dif of different types, depending on the study. A response can be changed in the facial expressions, where either through the uh, human intervention or machines, you measure the apparent change in facial muscle movement. A response can also be a physiological one, where seeing a particular stimuli can change the skin conductance, heartbeat, etc. The response can also be self-report, where depending on the presented stimuli, you rate on a scale according to along different dimensions. Now, before we move to how all this ties to our work, I would also like to talk about representation of concepts. As I mentioned before, the studies hypothesize that humans break down the information present in the surroundings into smaller components and or in order to assimilate in an efficient manner. A unit of this comp component is known as concept. Now, the way these concepts are formulated in the brain totally depends on the context, past experiences, as well as surrounding concepts. Now, these concepts can be grouped in various manners like hierarchically, sequentially, so on and so forth. One way of classifying the concepts are concrete concepts and abstract concepts. By definition, any concept that denotes something material is termed as concrete concepts and any concept that is immaterial is termed as abstract concepts. Basically, what it is mean, what it is meant by is that a concept like a car or a dog can be termed as concrete object as you can point to a car or dog and describe the term. Whereas a concept like honesty or universe can be termed as abstract concept because like generally abstract concepts is usually described with the help of other concepts. But a point to notice here is that this is not an absolute objective definition. It's very subjective in nature. The type of particular concept can vary from person to person and from situation to situation, even culture to culture. A very apt example of this is can be can be uh, taken by the term love. Now, someone might describe love as an abstract feeling and someone might point to his or her parent and symbolize the meaning of love. The reason why the construct of concreteness is studied because it helps us understand the underneath conceptualization of human brain and how it encodes and represents information. Now, as you can see from the title of a research, it can be easily understood that we are trying to evaluate the effective and the concreteness rating of different cultures. But the question is what it is that motivates us for this problem. As mentioned before, we need to have quantifiable data sets for different emotional stimuli, which we can use in future studies. In addition to that, it is very clear that the effective and the concreteness ratings for that matter are very diversified in nature. You cannot have a single data set representing ratings for the mass population. People belonging to different cultural backgrounds are brought up differently. And the way one group of people represent and encode information is surely different from another group. Moreover, there does not exist any dedicated data set which gives us average rating of effective experiences and co concreteness adhering to the Indian population towards emotional words. There are data sets like ANU which take average effective ratings of American sample towards different words. But if one has to conduct a psychological experiment taking Indian population into consideration, then one cannot use average ratings based on American population. This brings us to the objective of the problem. Primarily, we want to conduct a cross-cultural evaluation of the ratings between the Indian and the Western population in an attempt to know how the Indian population responds to the emotional words in terms of arousal, valence and concreteness. We want to investigate the self reported Indian ratings, whether self-reported Indian ratings are comparable to the Western normative ratings to evaluate the usability in the context of Indian research. So for this problem, we took a sample of 50 emotional words and instructed 50 participants to rate these 50 words along the dimensions of valence, arousal and concreteness. A novelty in our work was that the sampling of these 50 words was not done randomly. We made five groups which were high valence, high arousal, high valence, low arousal, low valence, low arousal, low valence, high arousal and neutral abstract. Each group contained 10 emotional words. 
These words were selected depending on the valence and the arousal ratings given by Warner, who conducted a similar experiment on the American population. As you can see that the words can be easily clustered into five groups. The figure on the right shows the average effective ratings of the 50 emotional words given by our Indian sample. Now, we conducted some statistical analysis on this data to understand it better. On an average, we saw that even though the valence ratings given by the Indian population were not statistic uh, significantly different than the Western population, we did see a significant difference in arousal and concreteness rating. The Indian sample showed overall higher arousal and concreteness ratings compared to the Western co counterparts. Further, anal analyzing uh, this data, we, we plotted the mean values against their standard deviation for three respective di dimensions and populations. For arousal ratings, we saw that the Western population showed higher variability compared to the Indian population while rating high arousing words. At the same time, while rating lower arousing words, the Western population showed higher consistency. Moving on to the valence trend, both the population showed their typical inverted U shape. However, the Western sample showed higher variability, whereas the Indian sample showed a greater curvature. In case of concreteness ratings, the Western data was more spread, whereas there was less variability in the Indian sample. These results directly point to the fact that we do not, we do indeed see difference in the way that the Indian population rate when compared to the Western population on emotional words. This difference can majorly be accounted to the cultural difference. Building up on the analysis, we also did two types of correlations. The first was for each dimension, we correlated the Western and the Indian values. We saw significant correlations across the three dimensions of arousal, valence and concreteness. We also correlated the dimensions pairwise for the two populations. Though we did see a significant correlation between valence and arousal, we did not see any significant correlation between the concreteness and arousal or concreteness or valence. This can be accounted because we only took emotional words as stimuli, which were all more or less having similar concreteness ratings. We also show uh, that the valence and the arousal ratings given by Indian population plotted on a heat map. This shows that the words belonging to the high valence high arousal were di diametrically opposite to the low valence low arousal. And similarly, the high valence low arousal was di diametrically opposite to low valence high arousal. The neutral category was more or less equidistant for distant from all the categories which was expected. Coming to the limitations and future directions of the study, we only had 50 participants in our study. Even though each participant rated 50 words, so per word participation was similar to previous studies, we, but still the more participation can give us an even better understanding of the trends that exist. Similarly, the corpus consisted of only 50 words, that too emotional. In future, we can analyze the same on a bigger corpus with words belonging to varying concreteness. We can also include physiological and psychological data and see how that affects the effective and the concreteness rating. With this, I conclude my presentation. Thank you. Uh, sure. I think there was some technical issue with the results. Uh, perhaps if you want to add uh, one minute, add anything that is not. Is sure, sir. If it's okay, I can share my screen and uh, show the presentation again, if that works. Uh, if we have time. Uh, I mean, I can, can the, go the but, uh, I can quickly go through the results once and then uh, come back. Yeah. So should we do that, uh, Chaitanya? Um, so we have two more minutes, sir. Right, right. So yeah, let's do yes. that quickly. Yes. Uh, All right. So as you can see that, uh, just give me a minute. Yeah. Is the screen visible? Yes. Right. So uh, I think this is the part where the screen stopped recording. And so you, so what we did was that we plotted the, uh, for, for the three dimensions, we plotted the, uh, mean data along with the standard, along the standard deviation to see the, what was the trend going on? 
and we saw for the arousal we saw that for the higher arousing word the western population showed higher variability compared to the indian population whereas for the low arousing words the western population showed uh, higher consistency compared to the indian population uh, for the valence part we saw the typical u inverted u graph for both of the population however for the western sample we, there was a higher variability uh, and whereas for the indian sample there was a greater curvature right and for the uh, similarly for the concreteness the western data was more spread compared to the indian population which had less variability right so uh, talking about the correlations we conducted two types of correlation one was for for each uh, for, for like the for, for each dimension we had we correlated the western values with the indian values so for valence for all the three types of dimensions we saw significant correlations we also on the also in addition to that we conducted across the across the sample uh, correlation between the, the dimensions so we saw that for a valence and arousal there was a significant correlation for both indian and the western sample but we did not see any correlations for uh, valence concreteness and arousal concreteness for both the samples so the reason for this is because right now in our uh, sample set the words that we took were only emotional words so generally emotional words all had a uh, like uh, on an average they had similar concreteness rating so there was no correlation with the variance and arousal uh this was the heat map that heat map that i was talking about so when plotted these 50 words when plotted using their uh, valence and arousal as xy coordinates on an heat map you we saw that uh, so as you can see with the color combination the darker the color the closer the words are so you see we can easily form four different uh, quadrants which means that the high valence high arousing words are diametrically opposite to the low valence low arousing words similarly high valence high arousing uh, low arousing words are diametrically opposite to its counterpart and at the last uh, column you see that the neutral uh, words are actually equidistant from all the other rest four categories right uh, and the limitations and the future uh, the future directions are like the right now we are we have taken 50 candidates for our uh, experiment but we tend to increase more because the more number of participants we have the better we can get the uh, like the average uh, trend we can get a better idea we can also increase the word corpus uh, right now we have taken 50 words but most of the so data, uh, data set studies which are there like uh, anu they have taken a lot many words right so we can increase the uh, our study was only focused on the emotional words for now but we can uh, in future increase more number of words uh, so yeah and also we would like to include the physiological and the psychological data yeah thanks uh, imansh one question from uh, professor rashmi gupta from iit bombay is uh, so uh, what is your recommendation based on this study what do we need to take care of uh in terms of when we use these emotional stu- stimuli especially high or low arousing emotional stimuli what is the recommendation coming based on the study that you have done the re- sorry can could you repeat there was problem with the audio could you please repeat the question yeah uh what is the recommendation that you give based on your study in terms of using these uh, emotional stimuli in indian setting uh, especially those uh, with high and low uh, high or low arousing emotional stimuli a uh, recommendation i i think so the words that we have uh, presented like the words that we have taken are good to go for uh, a future study because we saw that among the like within the category they were uh, the uh, there was there was consistency in the data so uh, if these 50 words are considered for any other future studies the words show well consistency and reliability the data shows well consistency reliability and can be uh, used to replicate further studies yeah fine thank you thank you so moving on to the next uh, uh, presentation reversibility and rationality in jean piaget's theory of reasoning by mark win stanley this is my talk on rationality and reversibility in jean piaget's theory of reasoning the talk has three parts the first part provides some background on the rationality and irrationality debate the second part illustrates piaget's theory of propositional reasoning and the role reversibility plays in rationality then i'll conclude 
The first part, the rationality and irrationality debate. Rationality is a modern problem. Human irrationality was not seriously questioned until the first half of the second of the 20th century, when psychological experiments cast doubt on rationality. Two contemporary theses emerged, the rationality and the irrationality theses. The rationality thesis says that human reasoning competence matches the normative principles of reasoning. The irrationality thesis, on the other hand, says that human reasoning competence diverges from these norms. The question that immediately springs to mind is, what are the normative principles the of reasoning? The audio is not clear, right? Logic and reasoning are different. Reasoning Sir, is like beliefs and belief revision. Logic, on the other hand, is the science of the necessary relation of consequence. And reasoning and logic often go their separate ways. Is that okay, sir? Since reasoning and logic are distinct, it is easy to sympathize with Harmon, who feels perhaps irrationally, that logic must have something special to do with reasoning, even if no one yet no one has yet been able to say what this might be. Part of the intuitive appeal of the standard picture is that logic plays a special role in reasoning. The standard picture, according to Stein, reasoning is different from logic, yet logic serves as a benchmark for reasoning. Rationality is reasoning in accordance with this be benchmark. In other words, the normative principle of reasoning are based on the rules of logic. The standard picture is a common denominator of both rationality and irrationality theses. Turning to the strategies in the rationality and irrationality debate, Performance and competence is another common denominator in this debate, and it is used strategically. Paraphrasing, paraphrasing Stein's words, champions and challenges of rationality turn on the interpretation of competence. Champions of the rationality thesis attempt to immunize the rationality of human reasoning against experimental evidence by means of the performance competence distinction. Challengers of the rationality thesis accept the performance competence distinction, but deny that reasoning competence conforms with the normative principles of reasoning based on logic. An alternative strategy for champions of the for the rationality champions is to undermine the standard picture. According to Stein, there are three ways to do this. The first denies that the normative principles of reasoning apply to everyone. The second denies that the normative principles of reasoning diverge from the human reasoning competence. The third argument denies that we have access to any object, objective norms of reasoning. The consequences are relativism, anthropocentrism, and dogmatism, respectively. Now part two. In this part, I will illustrate propositional reasoning and reversibility according to Piaget and argue that it corresponds to the alternative strategy too. Piaget imagines the following scenario. The bare bones of the scenario are as follows. A moving object keeps starting and stopping. The stops seem to be accompanied by a bulb lighting up. The first hypothesis the light is the cause, or an indication of the cause of the stops. Light P implies stop Q. The hypothesis is verified by ruling out that the bulb ever lights up without the object stopping, P and not Q. The second hypothesis, the light, instead of causing the stop, is caused by it. Stop Q implies light P. This is verified by ruling out that the object ever stops without the light going on, Q and not P. The structural poss possibilities of the two phenomena displayed in the table frame the scenario as follows. Column 1. Column 1 contains the four possibilities, four possible associations of two phenomena. Each association can be true or false, and observation determines whether they are in fact true or false. The 16 columns represent distinct combinations of true or false associations, although only the true associations are shown in the table. Disjunctively connecting 
the conjunctions in each column, the columns represent the disjunctive normal forms of the binary operators at the bottom. Note the binary operators only resemble the logical operators of propositional logic. There are differences. There are, proposition, there are propositions about the truth and the falsity of four conjunctions, and they are implicitly defined by a cognitive structure, the interpropositional grouping. The interpropositional grouping is like any cognitive structure, structured and structuring. The table represents the structure, the structured aspect, a taxonomy of relationships between two propositions. But reasoning is dynamic. And the interpropositional grouping represents a system of transformations. Note also, the columns are set out in pairs comprising the four complement of conjunctions. 7, 8, 9, 10 are conditional and its negation, conditional and its negation. And they play an important part in determining causality. Confronted with an unfamiliar situation, for example, light going on P and the object stopping Q, structural possibilities are instrumentalized and used as a cognitive tool to shine light on the relationship between the phenomena. A causal hypothesis is first formed, P implies Q, and tested by looking for observations that would falsify it. The falsifying observation is anticipated by the complement, P and not Q. If the first hypothesis is falsified, a new hypothesis Q implies P, compatible with the falsifying observation, is then formulated and tested by looking for P and not Q, its complement. Piaget shows that the inverse, correlative, and reciprocal, inverse, reciprocal, correlative, together with the identity operation, form a group, the INCR group, for short on the possibilities instrumentalized. There are six INCR groups altogether in the interpropositional grouping. In other words, there are six substructures within the operational structure. In summary, groups are completely reversible structures and they play a regulative role in reasoning. Note, there are similarities between the INCR group and the three laws of thought. The law of identity reflects the law, the identity operation in the grouping. The laws of non-contradiction and excluded middle reflect the complementarity of propositions, exhaustive yet no overlap. Returning to the side with the alternative strategies, Piaget's position corresponds to two, undermining the irrationality thesis by denying that it is possible for the normative principles of reasoning to diverge from human reasoning competence. In other words, the norms of reasoning are not independent of reasoning competence. Now to the conclusion. According to Piaget, rationality resides in the reversibility of human reasoning competence. The consequences are that Piaget has to explain away the findings of psychological experiments as performance errors, and that reasoning and rationality are anthropocentric. Finally, if rationality is indexed to reversibility in human reasoning competence, what about Harman's irrational belief that logic must have something special to do with reasoning? Piaget uses a mirror metaphor to represent this special relationship between logic and reasoning. Logic is the mirror of thought and not vice versa. Yeah, thank you for listening to my presentation. Uh, because of uh, time constraint, uh, we will go ahead with the next presentation, which is live presentation from Sristi Jain from Con uh, Center for Converging Technologies, University of Rajasthan, and the co-authors from SR University, uh, Varangal, uh, Telangana. And the topic is uh, numerosity-based go no go task performance influenced by subitizing an estimation range, but not relative numerosity. Uh, Sristi, uh, please uh, stick to 10 minutes presentation, right? Plus three minutes Q&A there is time. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just before you start, uh, one announcement is uh, if you have any questions for the previous talk, the speaker is uh, among our participant list. Please uh, direct your questions directly to Mark. 
right? Uh, so just to make sure uh, we address any of your questions from the speaker. Okay, go ahead, Srishti. Uh, okay, uh, good, good, uh, good evening, everyone. I hope you are doing fine amidst the COVID situation. I'm Srishti Jain. I'm a final year student of MTech in Cognitive and Neuroscience, currently working on my master's thesis under the guidance of Rakesh Sengupta, sir, the head of Creative Cognition, Center for Creative Cognition. Our research is indulged to understand the interaction between executive function and the number perception. The title of this presentation is Numerosity-Based Go-No-Go Task Performance, Influenced by Subitizing Range and esti Subitizing and Estimation Range, but not Relative Numerosity. Uh, if I ask you uh, to tell me the number of bottles or chairs in your room, I'm assuming they are less than five, you can quickly and accurately answer it. But if my question is, uh, how many items there are in your pen stand, and I'm again assuming there are a greater number of items in it, uh, you will take time, you will take longer time, and your, uh, there are chances that your answer is close enough, but not accurate. These are two different, two distinct behavioral phenomena, subitizing and estimation. Subitizing works for smaller numerosity, less than five, while estimation seems to operate at higher range of numerosity. Executive functions is a set of cognitive process facilitates goal-oriented goal behavior. Um, oh, my phone is ringing. Should I pick up the call or not? We, we have this impulse to look, uh, to look away, to, look away uh, to check our phones, who is calling you and who, what, what messages is there. But right now, uh, for me, to even I'm also habituated to check the phone right away. But right, right now, this response currently is somewhere in my brain inhibited. Inhibitory control and executive function gives us the flexibi flex uh, flexibility to suppress our automated, inappropriate, or irrelevant behavior. As my current short-term goal is to present in this conference, right now, receiving the call or even looking out for it is an irrelevant and inappropriate action. A lot of examples you can see in your day-to-day -day life. Like if someone is on diet, uh, he or uh, she will you know, uh, suppress, uh, he or she will uh, avoid to eat the sugar or processed food. To study involuntary control, uh, voluntary control and inhibitory control in humans, go no -go task is commonly used. This task, uh, this task has two types of stimulus. One is go stimulus, uh, where you respond, uh, you eat, and the second is no go stimulus, where you suppress your uh, suppress your action and you do not eat. We have modified this task using numerosity judgment. We have designed two experiments. Experiment one is based on relative numerosity comparison judgment. First, we have adapted the participants with the reference numerosity that is 13. The adaptation block cons uh, consisted of uh, 30 displays. Display, and uh, they, they, uh, this is for about 30 seconds to one minute. Each, uh, each display has the same number of dots, which is 13. Then the, then the test block uh, followed the adaptation block, in uh, which is comprised of 400 trials. Each trial, each trial, uh, for each trial, the participants had a participant had to compare the displayed numerosity with the reference numerosity, and they then they respond accordingly. We have drawn two conditions here. One is uh, named as small go and large go. In small go, a participant had to press for the lesser numerosities than the reference, and they do not have to press for the greater numerosities. Uh, and the second, the large co condition is the vice versa. So, uh, uh, the ratio of go no -go trial is seven is to three, uh, seven is to three. And uh, for the, uh, the total 400 trials were distributed equally in five, uh, in 10 blocks, five blocks for each conditions. Uh, let's take the example of sorry. Let's take the example of a small go a small go block. In small go block, 
there are uh, 40 trials out of uh, out of 40 trials 28 are go trials and 12 no go as go trials are more the participants will be inclined to press the key when greater numerosity will be displayed the participant will suppress the action of pressing the key so here lesser numerosities are 4 7 11 and greater numerosities are 5 18 and 21 the isi was 2000 milliseconds we have collected the data of 30 participants one was discarded as the participants did not perform experiment correctly we have computed the sorry we have computed the d prime value uh, d prime for both the conditions separately d prime is a sensitivity index we can in the plot we can see there is the difference between the d prime value of small go condition and the large go condition but this difference is not significant enough this uh, you can see the ANOVA results here. So we move to our experiment two. It is, the, the experiment is based on uh, absolute numerosity judgment. We have chosen two numerosity sets, small numerosity, which is one to five in the subitizing range. And the second is large numerosity set, which is 11 to 12. Based on this, first condition is derived as small numerosity, a small go, where small numerosity is the go condition, go trials. And, uh, large numerosities are no go stimulus and the second condition the large go condition is vice versa we have maintained all the variables like isi number of blocks number of trials ratio of no go no go no go trials uh, as the same in uh, same we have taken the experiment one do you think there will be any difference in both the conditions like small go and large go Okay, so these are the results for the absolute base numerosity judgment uh, go no go task. We have computed the D prime here again for this uh, for both the conditions separately. We can see here that there is a difference uh, between the small go condition and the large go condition, but this difference is significant. The well the p value is zero point zero zero one two here. So this was the uh, uh, this is the two experiments. Uh, uh, these are the experiment design and the results. What we have concluded from uh, the from from both the experiments is that the performance of go no go ta, ta, like the participants employ voluntary control more confidently and accurately in small go condition compared to large go condition. The mechanistic details of such an effect needed to be investigated further. Sorry, so sister, to interrupt in between. You have two more minutes. Uh, yeah, it's about to complete only in yeah, five yes. or ten yeah. seconds. Okay, so uh, the performance of go no go task is influenced by subitizing and estimation range throughout the experiment we have seen this, but there is no influence of the relative numerosity comparison judgment in on the go no go task. So this is all. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, Srishti. Uh, I think uh, do not see any questions. So we'll move to the next presentation. Thank you. Okay. Should I stop? Uh, again, uh, I request participants to think of some questions. Uh, Srishti is here online, so you can message her directly. Thank you. Uh, next one is uh, how do bad memories and ability to judge morality affect deceptive behavior by Dr. Rakesh Sen Gupta from SR University? Hello, everyone. Um... In the current work that I'm presenting here, we are talking about how do bad memories and ability to judge morality affect uh, deceptive behavior. To that end, we first need to consider what deceit actually is. We know that people have biased moral outlook. They view themselves as moral, but when given an opportunity to gain a reward by using dishonest means, people engage in dishonest behavior in spite of the psychological distress it creates. This small scale dishonest behavior does not change their view of being a good person, even when they engage in dishonest behavior repeatedly. 
researchers have shown that this is an ethical dissonance and that is resolved by making the justification which fit the criteria of being moral. They do this by disengaging from that dishonest action or by stretching the truth in their favor. You can look up some of the uh, references that I have put alongside it for more details. Religious and pious activities also lead people believing that they are cleansed and their sins are forgiven. Now, researchers argue that this is possible because unethical memories are forgotten over a period of time which reduces the impact of their immoral memories. People can also indulge in deliberate forgetting, uh, supported by the fact that people forget negative emotional events much more easily than the neutral ones. You can look up Anderson's uh, work from 2014. And the motivational forgetting of an event is said to disrupt the encoding of that event and reduce a person's ability to recall that event in the future as well. So, for instance, there is a very nice work by Kochaki in 2016 which showed that the people who cheat in coin task to win reward show reduced, uh, show, uh, reduced memory um, like an odd impairment of memory. Uh, for that unethical action, but not for ethical behavior or for neutral events. So, to a certain extent, it shows that the autobiographical memory for dishonest behavior is unclear after some time. Now, in our study, we wanted to study kind of the opposite. We wanted to say that will participants engaging in dishonest acts change their behavior if they are reminded of their previous misdeeds? And to do that, we first of all needed a very objective measure of deceit. And those of you who know about higher order cognition, the, this is extremely difficult to do. What, how can we measure, how can we put a number on something there of this higher order cognitive function like deceit at all? We need to, like any, any way to try to probe it might lead to the subject not being deceitful or willingly disrupting the data. Right? So what uh, we know from the previous research like Mazar et al's research from 2008 that deception is unlikely when chances of detection are high. So we kind of have to give people a cover. All the while we should know the ground truth to determine that they have been deceitful. Whereas we have to make the subjects believe, believe that they are probably not being recorded, which is a very convoluted thing if you guys realize. So to that end, we operationalized by using a game which is now in the currently in the in the public domain call it source code that's called a flappy bird if you remember this game you win points by going through those pipes by changing your by not the flapping the birds wings now this was a popular game and it was modified by us for a, for the current research we modified the source code here the participants have to move the bird who move persistently to the right while moving through parallel pipes the scores generally that the people see are measured after the bird passes through the pipe. Now participants are given n chances so like you know to make a high score. This n can change from experiment to experiment but generally we take give 20 chances to make high score and the score is not displayed on the screen and they are instructed to count their own score and report the highest score they have out of those n chances. Let's say you have played it 20 times and any time you hit a pipe, that's game over. So you have done it 20 times. What was the highest score you have re reached? Now the game allowed us to know actual score of the participants and the difference between the reported score and the actual score was termed for us in this context, a deceit score. So we nominally were able to objectively operationalize the idea of deceit. Now, the game has multiple rounds which helps us to measure these scores multiple times. 
Now for the first experiment, we used autobiographical memory characteristics questionnaires or AMCQ questionnaire to remind participants of their various misdeeds. We hypothesized that reminding participants of their previous misdeeds will reduce dishonest behavior and will show you how wrong we were. So we chose 70 participants selected from our university between ages of 18 to 25. We, they played a simple game where they can get a reward by make a, making a high score. The game was hosted in a website specially designed for the experiment. All required permissions were obtained prior to the experiments. The participants were made to use either their own PC or their mobile phones or use the computers in our lab, whichever was convenient for them. The participants were given proper instructions before the start of the experiment. Details of the participants were collected before the experiment along with the consent. Now, and those were all stored in created using PHP MyAdmin and MySQL servers. Now, before the participants began with the experiment, they were explained that one of the top 10 high scorers will stand to receive some Bluetooth headphones. And their objective is to make one of the 10 high scores. The participants are first given a 10 trial demo so that they have an understanding of how the game looks and how they play and uh, during that time the game doesn't show their scores but they will have to count their own scores either by counting the number of pipes the bird crosses or by, but, or by counting the ding sounds that occurs after bird crosses to the pipes this experiment was divided into three parts in first part they had a they played the game which had 40 trials divided in two blocks so after finishing first block of 20 trials participants are required to require to enter a high score they have made during this 20 trial gameplay then a high score ledger is displayed to the participants with 10 highest scores we basically like these 10 high scores most of it were made up by us <laughs> giving them an idea as to how much they would need to score in order to be among the top 10 players and after the high score is displayed the participants play the game again for 20 trials and once again they are asked for their highest score and the top 10 high scores are displayed in the second part of part, the participants are asked to write about 100 words of one of their memories in which they have cheated, deceived or behaved in any amoral way. And then they are provided with the AMCQ questionnaire, autobiographical memory characteristic questionnaire consists of 63 questions on a 7 point scale. So the AMCQ can compare memories in 14 factors like vividness, belief in accuracy, place details, sensory details accessibility sharing, observer perspective and such and so forth. Now, in the third part of the experiment, they play the game again for two blocks and at the end of each block, they report their high score and the top 10 high scores are displayed again. So now out of the 70 participants, we had to uh, discard the data of 13 participants due to technical issues. The remaining 57 participants were divided in two groups. One who did not report deceitful memories and two participants who reported deceitful memories. So this is the score that we are uh, we uh, we have obtained of the deceit scores for different blocks. There are four blocks B1, B2, B3, B4. If you remember B1 and B2 was before the AMCQ questionnaire and B3 and B4 were after the AMCQ questionnaire. Now, a Pearson uh, correlation was computed between average receipt code and AMCQ score, but there was no significant correlation. And, but uh, if we can see that one of the things that the, there is a very interesting trend that we observed after we did the repeated measures ANOVA, that <laughs> this within the groups, group one and group two, we observed a significant interaction. And we can see in both the uh, <coughs> neutral and model condition, there seems to be an increase in deceit score, but there is a sharp increase in this group two who reported the amoral uh, memories or deceitful memories. So deceit score increased after they were reminded of their misdeeds. So this, but we know that morality salience proposed by Schindler says that when participants are reminded of the morality, they become less deceitful. <laughs> Our results suggest that people are reminded when people are reminded of the deceitful memories and are made to write, there is an increase in their deceitfulness. 
The result is in contrary to the belief that we repeatedly exhibit deceitful behavior because deceitful autobiographical memory is hindered during recall. In this experiment, we have not checked for isolated effects of reward on deceit and we have not controlled for participants being able to see another participant's scores, which we believe might have played a substantial role. <coughs> In the experiment two, we used an MCT questionnaire uh, which uh, judges moral uh, moral scenarios moral choice test and this here instead of your autobiographical here you judge the moral choices of others <coughs> this moral competence test developed by Lynn instead of uh, AMCQ questionnaire that's the only change that was made in this experiment and we will go to the results directly we saw that there is an like with an effect size of 0.25 people like you know continuously increase their deceit score as opposed to a rapid increase or a sharp increase after amcq questionnaire it was more gradual increase but if you notice the scales of the deceit score if we have here uh, they are much lower than uh, what mcq questionnaires were <laughs> This is consistent with previous studies in morality, where that human beings, uh, humans judge mistakes of others more harshly than their own. One possible reason why this is scores of the participants increased <coughs> may have been due to attractiveness of the reward or due to the competitive nature of the game. Further studies have to incorporate these drawbacks as, study, as well as study isolated effects of reward and isolated effects of the competition in general. And in terms of future direction, we want to see how the memory characteristics of moral, deceitful and neutral memories compare with each other. We expect to see differences in vividness, emotional violence of those memories as shown in literature. And this is where I'm going to stop. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Rakesh. Uh, Rakesh is online. So I have sent one query from Aditi to him because he said uh, he has bad throat, so I'm sure he'll be able to answer your query. Please direct your query direct to him. Uh, and let's move to the next presentation, uh, which is uh, by uh, Shivam Bohra. Uh, it's a combined uh, work from Shivam Bohra and uh, Professor Narayanan Srinivasan, both from uh, CBCS Allahabad, Trait mindfulness is associated with shorter temporal horizons, but not lower delay discounting. Hello, my name is Shivam, and today I will be presenting my study title. Trait mindfulness is associated with shorter temporal horizons, but not lower delay discounting. My co-author for this study was Dr. Narayanan Srinivasan, and he was also my guide throughout the study. Okay. Theories of mindfulness and impulsivity, especially delayed discounting, lay an emphasis on an orientation towards the present moment. However, impulsivity may be a result of an hedonistic orientation towards the present moment, while in mindfulness, an emphasis is laid upon attention towards the present and non-reactivity to experiences. Despite the theoretical link between time perception, mindfulness, and impulsivity, these three factors have not been studied simultaneously. Impulsivity has been operationalized using multiple measures such as self-report questionnaires, response inhibition tasks, and delay discounting tasks. Delay discounting, especially monetary delay discounting, is strongly correlated with self-report measures and behaviors associated with impulsivity. Monetary delay discounting is fairly stable over many months and has thus been called a trade variable, making it a good proxy for studying impulsive decision making. As per the perceived time-based model of intertemporal choice, which was proposed by Kim and Zauberman in 2009, Psychological distance of the delay, that is the temporal distance, influences how a reward is discounted at that delay. Some studies have found direct influences of trait mindfulness and trait impulsivity on temporal discrimination, estimation, and reproduction tasks. 
These tasks, however, are measured time, measure time perception in the order of seconds. How such orientation towards the present influences time perception for longer delays has not been well studied. And this study, this question was at the core of this study. The objective were, was to study the relationship between trait mindfulness and intertemporal decision making and subjective temporal distance. We also wanted to test the prediction of the perceived time based model of intertemporal choice. Our hypothesis or expectation was that trait mindfulness will be negatively correlated with discount factor K and discount factor K would be positively correlated with temporal distance. And finally, temporal distance would be negatively correlated with trait mindfulness. The experiment was conducted entirely online and it was hosted on sitoolkit.org. It had three parts, as you can see on your screen. I will be talking about each part in more detail now. Totally, we collected uh, the calculated sample size was 50 and the experiment link was shared with 75 participants out of which the first 56 participants, their data was considered for analysis. The, the delay discounting measure we used was Kirby's monetary choice questionnaire, which has a total of 27 questions. You can see some of the questions on your screen right now as an example. In the original questionnaire, the monetary value is in terms of dollars. So we converted it to Indian rupees based on the current purchasing power parity, PPP value of rupees 21. Trade mindfulness was measured using the five factor mindfulness questionnaire. And finally, temporal distance was measured by asking participants, how far does a day X days from now feel on a scale of one very near to 99 very far, 21 unique delays, sorry, 23 unique delays, same as in Kirby's monetary choice questionnaire, were presented to the participants in a random order. During analysis, five participants were excluded for answering the same option for all questions in either Kirby's MCQ or the temporal distance task. Normality was checked using the Shapiro will test. Given that the discount factor K was not normally distributed, we performed Spearman rank correlation. Upon fitting the temporal distance data to a particular equation that we use, I'll be talking about that in the next slide, 11 participants were found to have a poor fit. Thus, a Spearman rank correlation was performed on the remaining 39 participants. For the delay discounting analysis, discount factor K for each participant was calculated using the method described by Kirby et al. in the 1999 paper. Total FFMQ score was calculated for each participant using the scoring rules provided. For temporal distance, responses of the participants were modeled using the following equation, like T equals A multiplied by T to the power B, where capital T is a subjective temporal distance. Small t is the delay, the objective number of days that we presented in, in days. And A and B are two parameters. Now, parameter A captures the overall level of time contraction, while B captures the degree of non-linearity or diminishing sensitivity towards time. In their study, Kim and Zoberman found that a was positively correlated with the discount factor, while B was negatively correlated with the discount factor. Um, parameters A and B were calculated for each participant. And we know that A can take any positive value, while, while B can take any value between 0 and 1. In our results, we found that significant correlation was there between total FFMQ score and coefficient A, where the R was found to be minus 0.346 with a p-value of uh, less, less than 0 0.05. The correlations between discount factor K and measures of mindfulness or temporal distance were not found to be significant. So as you can see, um, out of our three hypotheses, we could only our data could only verify one hypothesis. We could only support one hypothesis. That means that is a correlation between a negative correlation, in fact, between FFMQ score and uh, the coefficient A was observed.
Okay. Total FFMQ was significantly negatively correlated with temporal distance parameter A. These negative, negative correlation shows that the future appears subjectively closer with an increase in trait mindfulness. Trait mindfulness and the practice of mindfulness have been observed to influence time perception in the order of seconds and minutes. Subjective time is expanded for those trait or high on trait mindfulness. This, st <coughs> Excuse me. this study contributes to the time perception literature by showing how trait mindfulness influences time perception in the order of days. Subjective experience of time expands in seconds and minutes, but in the order of days, the future appears closer. The data did not support the predictions of the perceived time-based model of intertemporal choice, as no significant correlation or relationship was seen between the discount factor K and measures of uh, temporal distance. Murphy and McKillop in, from 2012 also used the same measures to study delay discounting and mindfulness and found no significant correlation between the two measures taken together with the results of the current study. It suggests that trait mindfulness may not influence delay discounting. However, further studies are needed on other measures of impulsivity or discounting and temporal distance over multiple time scales. Um, thank you. That was my presentation. Um, we will be now taking questions regarding it. One question is, uh, uh, there are other dimensions of uh, time perception apart from uh, delay discounting. And so uh, what is your take on the impact of, uh, you know, uh, uh, other dimensions of time perception on uh, the temporal discounting. Um, yes, sir. So you had asked uh, that there are other measures of time perception and how that influences delay discounting, mm -hmm. right? Like, um, so delay discounting mainly we have been um, studying like in, in terms of, let's say, if, if we merely delay something by a few seconds or a few hours, then we also have to look at how a time, time is perceived in that level. Right? So for example, in, in animals, Often delay discounting is done, let's say, um, by delaying it for a few minutes or, you know, maximum of few seconds. Then in that case, if you want to understand, then for that order, uh, time in the order of seconds or minutes would be more useful. But because in humans, we are looking at such a long time scale, like, you know, days, weeks, months, sometimes even years. So that is why in this particular study, we chose to go for the days or months on which we are asking the human to discount. Because... Um, we know, like in, like I've been talking also in, in the, uh, in my video that, uh, in, in case of mindfulness, time expands actually in, in the, in order of seconds and minutes, but how, and, but it's an expanded time. Uh, so we don't really know, we can't really comment of how that expanded time will influence like discounting in days. So we found that because we are asking a person to rate the subjective distance in days or weeks also. We found that for a person with higher mindfulness, it is actually closer. The, the uh, delay is actually a little closer. So uh, there, even though we can look at uh, things in, in, you know, like uh, temporal estimation task or temporal reproduction task, they would not really be useful to help us predict in the discounting in days because it, it theoretically doesn't really say, make much sense to me. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Shiva. Uh, let's move to the next presentation, uh, which is uh, multiple object awareness capacity is larger and correlates with visual working memory capacity. Uh, this is a presentation by Prasad Mane and Narayanan Srinivasan, both from CBCS Allahabad. Hello all, my name is Prasad. The title of our study is the multiple object awareness capacity is larger and correlates with visual working memory capacity. So, as we know, the moment we open our eyes, we experience a vast 
rich and detailed visual world. But the results from various studies like change blindness, inattentional blindness, even Pulisic multiple object tracking experiment indicates limitation. So here comes the main question. Why do we think we see so much when the scientific evidence suggests we see so little? There are two ways researchers try to answer this question. First, our attention, perception, and working memory is limited, and observers' rich perceptual experience may be just an illusion. And sec on the other hand, some researchers believe that cognitive mechanisms like attention and working memory may be limited, but perceptual awareness is not. So recently in 2018, Wu and Wolf modified a classic uh, multiple object tracking, that is MOT task. I'll explain the task in detail, but for now, we can simply say instead of giving only one attempt to track an object, they provided many and argue that the partial and probabilistic knowledge of object location is still useful knowledge. That is, saying that object is somewhere in the right corner or in the center is better than saying I don't know where the object is. And by giving the margin of error, they calculated something they called multiple object awareness, that is MOA capacity, which they argued is double than the standard capacity estimate. So our first objective was to replicate the findings, indicating that EMOA scores are considerably larger than multiple identity tracking scores. Our second aim was to see whether EMOA scores would also be consistently larger than visual working memory scores. And finally, we checked the correlation between these scores. So method. So total 40 volunteers participated, participated in the study. Uh, we calculated visual working memory capacity through a visual change detection task designed by Vogel and Machizawa in 2004. So as you can see in the figure, the task consisted of an initiated stimulus with eight colored squares, four on each side, presented briefly for 100 milliseconds, and the test array presented after a 900 millisecond retention interval. Participants were queued to the side in which change may occur. A change a color square change in the half of the trials and there was no change in the other half of the trials. So total 210 trials were collected and based on participants response, hit rate and false alarm rate was calculated. Visual working memory capacity was calculated by the formula K is equal to S into in bracket H minus F where K is the memory capacity, S is the size of the array, H is the observed hit rate and F is the false alarm rate. MOA capacity was measured using a multiple object tracking task that was designed by Wu and Wolf. So in this task, the display consists of uh, shapes of 16 animals that move randomly without collision with a speed of one degree per second. The task was to identify the location of the specified animals once the animals stop moving, which happens at a random interval of seven to 20 seconds. And they, they are replaced by the gray disk. So here, Instead of giving single click to find a correct location, as in a classic EMOT task, participants were asked to click on a location by location until they find the correct location for a specified animals. And once the target is found, observers click again to restart the motion of the same display. And during each extended trial, there are 30 test episodes. And there are total four extended trials. So that means uh, there are total uh, 120 test episodes. The number of clicks that were used by the participants to track the animals is used to calculate the MOA capacity. And MIT scores of the participants were calculated by discarding the response, responses that used more than one click. So when we calculated the, the capacities, the visual or key memory capacity scores uh, uh, across participants range between 1.4 to 4.8 which is very similar to what Vogel and Machizawa got, that is uh, 1.5 to 5. The range of VMOA capacity was 4.3 to 10.8, with average capacity of 7.3, which is a little less than what Wu and Wolf estimated in their model, that is 8.4. And MIT scores was ranged from 1.9 to 5.1, with an average of 3.2, which is very similar to uh, the Wu and Wolf study and other uh, previous studies. So we did a paired sample t-test to find, is there any significant difference in the capacities? We found 
the difference between MOA capacity and MIT scores were significantly different with very high effect size. Then the difference between visual or key memory capacity and MOA scores also uh, significantly different with again with the high effect size. And at last the difference between visual or key memory capacity and MIT scores was also significantly different. Here we got medium effect size of 0.51. Also we checked the correlation between different scores we found visual working memory capacity and MOA capacity was significantly correlated with uh, uh, with R value is equal to 0.67 and visual working memory capacity is accountable for 45% of variance in the MOA capacity. Then visual working memory capacity and MIT scores was also significantly correlated with R value is equal to 0.57. And finally, MOA capacity and MIT scores was also significantly correlated. So there is a successful repl replication of the earlier results. That is, MOA scores are greater than MIT scores, indicating greater number of objects tracked when the imperfect knowledge taken into con consideration. In addition, MOA scores measured through object tracking experiment were also higher than visual working memory capacity scores measured through change detection tasks, indicating that effect is possibly generalizable to other measures of visual working memory. The significant correlations indicate that those whose capacity is deemed better using one measures used in a study are better with other me measures. That is, participants with higher visual chemical capacity has higher MOA capacity, indicating that these measures are reliable and consistent. So at last, further studies need to consider the other aspect of conscious awareness and whether the information that we are conscious of is underestimated as well. So these are the references I use. Thank you. Thank you, Prasad. Uh, one question is, uh, uh, this is uh, sort of largely a replication study, right? Uh, the relationship between visual working memory capacity, multiple object awareness, tracking, multiple object tracking. So uh, what is the, so based on these uh, replications, where do you want to go forward? Yeah, sir. So actually, um, uh, we want to say that uh, the method that earlier used by the other researchers, uh, they say that uh, we see only three, four objects while tracking. So I think uh, they use very strict criteria to uh, uh, say that uh, we can track only a few objects but i think uh, if we do we have something uh, called uh, uh, probabilistic knowledge about other object also so if we can track a three four object very confidently then there are some more objects that we can track with some uh, imperfect knowledge or a very imprecise or probabilistic knowledge that we can have uh, something about that, but we are not sure about that. Uh, so for example, uh, while in a natural world, if, if we can uh, uh, see a few objects, like for example, we, we are traveling in a car, so uh, we can see in the road, but uh, some, sometimes uh, something happens that uh, we see, maybe we saw a half naked man in, in the road. We, can, we are not sure about uh, if we saw that man or not, but we see back and check whether we saw that to confirm the uh, if we have we, we saw that man or not. So I think we have something imprecise knowledge uh, when we uh, when we talk about a visual awareness. So that was the aim of our study. Yeah, right. Uh, interesting. So that uh, this actually this can be taken to the ecologically valid uh, scenarios. Right, uh, realistic scenarios of uh, people uh, tracking and being need to be doing something, being aware of multiple objects. Right, yes. uh, that's definitely one area. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, any other thoughts, Prasad? Or uh, uh, no, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, move on to the next uh, presentation. Is live presentation by. Indupriya, uh, this is a paper from uh, 
B. Indupriya and uh, Dr. Varsha Singh from IIT Delhi and uh, Queensland, University of Queensland, Australia. Intra-individual variability in reaction time, a marker of uh, sex differences in prefrontal cortex cognitive control tasks. So uh, good afternoon, no, good evening to all. Uh, I am a second year PhD student from IIT Delhi. So my topic is intra-individual variability in reaction time a marker of sex differences in prefrontal cortex cognitive control task. Uh, this is a part of the study is a part of a larger study conducted uh, in IIT Delhi by Dr. Vasha Singh. She's my guide. Yeah, coming to the introduction, uh, cognitive control is a remarkable feature of human cognitive system. It is the ability to configure itself for the performance of specific tasks through appropriate adjustment in the perceptual selection. The processes behind such adaptability refers collectively as a cognitive control. So in simple words, uh, it helps us uh, when you have to concentrate or pay attention to any task. The prefrontal cortex uh, measures such as working memory, flexibility, inhibitory and attention control gives us an understanding about the cognitive control system. But the inconsistencies in those measures are uh, not conclusive and mostly addressed by the uh, deficit or uh, uh, accuracy scores. So variability uh, is a uh, is variability is considered as a viewed as a potential driving force of development and a potential indicator of ongoing processes. Therefore, it is considered or treated as an important source of information. So variability in reaction time in the widely used task of cognitive control is indicative of inconsistency attributed to integrity of prefrontal cortex. So we've used a, a reaction time measures, a rarely used measure of uh, cognitive variability, which is called indra individual reaction time variability, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, in general called per, uh, variability uh, within person variability. So unlike the uh, conventional indicators of cognitive performance, which is based on measures of central tendency and involve assessment of an individual on a single measure, administered on a single occasion, intra-individual variability, uh, variability indicates, uh, these indicators are based on measures of variability, uh, uh, which involves assessing fluctuations in performance of an individual on a single measure administered on multiple occasion. It captures within trial variability in reaction time in a given cognitive task. So intra-individual variability reaction time considered as a behavioral indicator of processes related to brain integrity. It's calculated using standard deviation divided by mean uh, reaction time, unlike the uh, usual reaction time, which actually only looked into the uh, uh, mean reaction time. Coming to the executive functions, <clears throat> executive function is considered, it's an umbrella term. It's considered more as a multi-dimensional construct comprised of several cognitive uh, processes. Uh, it's, uh, it can be, it is considered as a both unitary and diversified uh, sub uh, components, which is interrelated. So executive function reflects cognitive control in the form of functions such as planning, working memory, inhibition, mental flexibility, et cetera. So uh, sex differences is considered as one of the major variability when you look at executive function and reaction time. The sex differences in executive function and uh, intra-individual variability reaction time are separately documented, but there is little or no evidences on the sex differences of correlated or unified EF tasks based on the variability in reaction time. So we, used, uh, we speculated that intra-individual variability reaction time could be used as a robust marker to differentiate EF tasks. The current study understands the unitary nature of EF in males and females using intra-individual variability. <clears throat> So uh, we uh, this uh, uh, this study is uh, conducted in IIT Delhi campus. We have actually called uh, we've given flyers and we have called uh, engineering students for this uh, study. The participants the sample size were 183, in which 149 males. The mean age was 22 years. Uh, we used Pebble test battery. We administered four different tasks. Uh, starting with digit span, which measures attention and working memory, Iowa gambling task, 
which is a card sorting task, gambling task, um, which uh, measures decision making ability, Tower of Hanoi, which measures planning and mental flexibility, and Simon task, which measures the response inhibition. <clears throat> Uh, we've used a correlation to compare uh, the mean reaction time and intra-individual reaction time. So this is our result. So we could see that uh, in both uh, reaction time uh, measure and intra-individual reaction time measures, working memory uh, results uh, are mean RT is positively correlated with inhibitions in females, uh, both in I, uh, reaction time and IIVRT. Uh, when it comes to the uh, reaction time measures, working memory mean RT positively correlated with decision making in males. Males showed no significant correlations uh, and uh, inhibition mean RT positively correlated with flexibility and gambling task decision making. So in IAVRT reaction time, uh, we could see only working memory uh, reaction time is positively correlated with inhibitions in females. So uh, in the results, uh, this is our uh, understanding. Uh, in females, working memory intra-individual reaction time was correlated with that of inhibitory control in both mean reaction time and intra-individual variability reaction time. Uh, when you look at the same uh, pattern in males, we did not find a correlation. The correlation did not meet the level of significance. So even in uh, IAVRT, the correlation is stronger compared to uh, usual reaction time measures. So we started with uh, the speculation that variability in the form of IAVRT is a potential indicator of sex differences in of cognitive control. So the uh, current results suggest uh, uh, two possible uh, explanation of this. Uh, first one is the this result, the current results add support to studies that indicate inhibition control task requires working memory. Uh, and uh, it is possible that reliance on working memory resources differ between the sexes. So uh, the, uh, when you look at the independent literature in executive functions, uh, we could see that there are uh, differences between females and males in terms of processing speed, uh, visual spatial working memory, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But the current results suggest that the working memory, the, the unified task, which is the working memory and the inhibition will be uh, from the same source. And uh, uh, there is a sex differences in that domain if you consider it as a unified source. So we have uh, limitations. Uh, so this is a part of another larger study. So our sample size has an unbalanced sex ratio, uh, which is an indication of the skewed sex ratio in IIT population. Uh, we did not uh, calculate, uh, we did not measure a specific intelligence or I IQ test, though these uh, students have passed the same uh, entrance exam to join in the IIT. So measure of intelligence, academic performance would have allowed us to interpret these results in a larger context of cognitive sex differences relevant to education. This could be looked into the uh, possible uh, the, uh, future studies. Uh, in conclusion, present results indicate intra-individual variability in reaction time might be a robust marker to understand the integrity of cognitive control or prefrontal cortex-based tasks and variations due to sex differences. Cognitive sex differences might add to our understanding of cognitive control and the extent of variability across population. These are some of the key references which I looked into, uh, basic two papers. Uh, we are acknowledging that the work is presented as a part of DST Cognitive Science Research Initiative Grant. The data was collected as part of faculty in the disciplinary research project. We thank Mr. Vaishali for her research assistance and the participants for their time. Thank you. Do one question. Uh, it's in the sent in the chat by Mohan Majundar. Is how do you explain the sex difference in intra-individual variability in reaction time? Now, why why does one right one you know one would expect uh, for example aging related changes right they, these are naturally explainable in terms of the variability within the individual of the reaction time right why should uh, sex difference play a role uh, that is I think the question. Sir, uh, 
current data did not answer your question so all we can say that uh, there so is in the current data you did not see evidence for these right no that's what you are saying yes 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 right. yes we all we could say from our data is uh, we found a uh, uh, two different patterns in females and males when you use intra individual variability reaction time but we did not use the same pattern when you use mean reaction time so which we feel is intrigued and has to be explored further in future research uh, and uh, we feel that intra individual variability reaction time has to be calculated uh, along with rt in all the cognitive functions right but uh, the point was uh... What was the rationale? You know, why did you think you should expect a difference? Uh, you know, gender-based difference in this uh, I I V R T. Uh, sir, Any particular gen- reason. Okay, okay. So gender, uh, the sex differences are already reported in executive functions and reaction time separately. That was evident in the literature. so we actually use that uh, basic uh, speculation to understand that can be found uh, how unified or uh, divisible this executive function task based on this uh, variability so we did not look into the uh, data we did not actually we instead of looking at the uh, scores or accuracy we looking at the variability to understand the uh, uh, unity and divisibility of the executive function that's what we did in the current study so we won't, may not be able to tell why there is a sex difference happened uh, what we could say is this is what we found from the data right so uh, do you think there are any other compounds you need to consider in this uh, study the variability is a natural phenomenon right i mean it's very well known uh, is a huge body of work in terms of uh, perhaps neural noise or what is the origin of this variability right trial to trial variability in the outcome measure that you are measuring not just reaction time many other decision making and many other uh, uh, this this variability is uh, found to be natural both in animals and humans uh, what is uh, Uh, do you think there are other compounds in this study that you need to pay attention to that might actually cause variability but you haven't accounted for okay so that uh... the important factor is our data is skewed in uh, in terms of uh, representation uh, so we had uh, male representation uh, like higher male representation compared to the female representation uh, which is uh, like quite common in iit like structure that is one thing uh, that is major uh, yeah and that you also yeah. mentioned that uh, yeah. it's reasonable to expect the iqs are uh, yes 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 sort of balanced yes. because they're all coming from similar examinations yeah. or background we we still we found that uh, if some kind of screening measures we could use to understand their basic cognitive functions for example the speed and uh, the memory there will be variability if you look into this population also so we have uh, we could not address that but if you could use some other screening tools uh, it would have been better it would have been more accurate okay thank you indu uh, thank you for thank you okay so we move on to the next uh, presentation which is uh, uh, musical aptitude a better indicator of reaction time than musical training and i am assuming uh, this will be presented by alagammal Uh, Ashwarya from Triple I T Hyderabad. Hi, my name is Alagmal, and this is my paper, Musical Aptitude and Musical Training as Joint Indicators for Musical and Non-Musical Abilities. Musical aptitude is the innate ability of humans to recognize hearing patterns in sound sequences such as rhythm and pitch. Studies have found that music higher musical aptitude can be found in non-musicians as well. and musical training is something that is also associated with higher auditory precision and better processing of musical elements as well as faster reaction times 
Now we move on to far transfer effect. Far transfer effects occurs when there is a transfer of learner knowledge and skills from the taught context to another dissimilar context. For example, playing a musical instrument can lead to improvements in cognitive uh, con uh, cognitive improvements in the brain. And for further details on this far transfer effect, we can refer this paper, Bigendi and Tillman. Now we move on to three papers which work with, uh, with works that is similar to ours in that they use troop tasks to assess re uh, reaction times in musicians. Now uh, the first paper uses children uh, between the ages of 8 to 10 year old with control, music training and sports training group. And the, uh, all three papers use this troop task and the results that we see in the first paper is that there is changes in cognitive control brain networks during this troop task, however they do not talk about reaction time. Uh, on the second paper however, they use professional and amateur musicians between 18 to 55 years old and uh, we find that there was no difference in reaction time between amateurs and musicians or non-musicians. However, there is a significant uh, difference between pro musicians and uh, professional musicians and non-musicians. Now, in the third paper, however, again they've used professional and amateur musicians. Uh, in the third paper, however, the results are that the reaction times are significantly lower in professional musicians as compared to amateur musicians, while not taking uh, while uh, not taking uh, non-musicians into account. Now the limitation of these three studies is that they do not take into effect the, uh, mus uh, account the effect of musical aptitude on reaction times or musical training. Now the Stroop task, coming on to the Stroop task, it is a very good uh, way to assess the processing speed of the brain and it can be a good indicator of reaction times. Now the aims and objectives of my project is that we investigate group differences in musical aptitude and reaction times uh, between participants group based on musical training and then we also examine the role of musical aptitude on reaction time in adults. Now coming out to data set, we use a subset of the 20 data set that Chris Cuolo used. We use 59 participants out of which 28 are females and 31 are males with training ranged from 6 months to 37 years. Now musical training was assessed in two ways, uh, but as a continuous variable which is the number of years of playing the instrument and as a combination of number of years of playing and number of years of training uh, given as a categorical variable where participants were uh, uh, group based on three, group one non-musicians, group two amateur musicians and group three professional musicians. Now for musical aptitude measurements we use seashore test and for reaction time measurement we use troop interference time scores which is basically just the subtraction between the incongruent task versus the color naming stroop tasks. Now the methods that we used are group differences that is uh, musical group differences of the participants for, uh, uh, for their uh, musical aptitude and reaction time scores. In addition we also check the correlation for all the variables uh, like musical aptitude, reaction times and years of playing music. Then we additionally also check partial correlation, uh, removing the effect of musical aptitude first and then removing the effect of years of musical training next. Now we move on to results. Now uh, as this result, the scatter plot shows, uh, there is a very high correlation between the seashore pitch and rhythm scores which is expected. Now we also find that non-musicians as well as amateur musicians uh, irrespective of any kind of training they all have uh, higher musical aptitude scores. Now next we move on to group differences. Now group differences were observed for musical aptitude scores and uh, reaction time scores which is the stroop interference time and the uh, seashore pitch and rhythm time. We see that for uh, all three groups the musical aptitude and reaction times were significantly different. But however we do not know which three groups, uh, which of these groups differ uh, particularly. So for that when we do post hoc tests we find out that 
uh, non musicians and professional musicians are the only group which differ in musical aptitude scores and as well as reaction time scores there is no significant difference uh, seen between non musicians and amateur musicians or amateur musicians and professional musicians now next we come to the correlation plot results now correlation shows that all uh, basically most of the variables are highly correlated with each other however something interesting that we can see is that uh, the reaction time is negatively correlated with both musical aptitude and years of playing music which shows that higher the musical aptitude or years of playing music the faster your reaction time will be next we move on to the partial correlation results partial correlation when controlling for years of musical training and controlling for uh, musical aptitude uh, scores separately as well as uh, an aggregate of musical aptitude scores we find that uh, uh, controlling for years of musical training there is no significant differences or significant correlations that we observe however when we control for musical aptitude there are significant negative correlations that can be observed now we move on to the discussion so we see mainly these uh, takeaway points from the study high musical aptitude was associated with faster reaction times as seen in the correlation uh, correlation uh, values participants in our study with no musical training background also demonstrated high musical aptitude as seen by the scatter plot and contrary to travis et al we did not find any difference in reaction time observed between professional and amateur musicians now another uh, another uh, important discussion that we would like to say is that more training seems to result in faster reaction time times when controlling for aptitude whereas controlling for years of training did not produce any significant effects which seems to say that when removing aptitude from the picture high training does indeed lead to faster reaction times showing that musical aptitude has a kind of an independent effect but removing effect of years of training however has no significant effect now limitations of the study is that it is true that uh, there can be uh, other tests other uh, musical aptitude tests that can be better suited for our study which we did not uh, uh, explore and another limitation is that there is insufficient data for non musicians with high musical aptitude now the conclusion of the study is that musical training shouldn't be the only indicator of musical or uh, as an indicator of musical or non musical abilities especially in the context of far transfer effects since work we did prove that irrespective of training musical aptitude is still an uh, individual quality varying from person to person so i i would believe that uh, uh in further studies when uh, studying musical abilities or non musical abilities as a far transfer effect we should always use a combination of musical aptitude and musical training uh as a uh, better assessor so thank you for my uh, thank you for attending thank you alagama uh uh yeah a couple of questions one is uh, the choice of this is actually data collected in the 2019 paper right uh, the reanalyzed yes. uh, reanalyzed with a uh, view to uh, differentiate between the effects of uh, years of training and the aptitude right you yes. wanted to yes. look at uh, so do you have access to different uh, uh, reaction times for congruent incongruent trials uh, Uh, see uh, this uh, uh, you know the stroop test uh, traditionally used for uh, assessing uh, inhibitory control uh, cognitive uh, sort of interference right these kind of higher order effects uh, of executive function right and uh, it is used uh, the score from that is used as proxy for generic you know reaction time right uh, so what is the uh, do you think that you could further improve by looking at perhaps a subset right in this where you have reaction times for the for congruent trials which are supposed to be faster faster across individuals right those could be uh, i don't know i mean or uh, if 
uh, independently actually replicating the study with a simple reaction time task, right? Uh, yes, sir, uh, definitely. In other words, uh, <clears throat> Stroop task is not, uh, uh, you know, just a simple uh, uh, right. reaction time task, right? That is the... Right. Oh, yes, certainly. Uh, yes, sir, we can do further work on this. Right now, we just did a preliminary, uh, you know, uh, test on how, uh, if we can use the Stroop interf uh, interference scores and see some sort of effect or some sort of result and we did notice that so we will certainly look into further uh, you know like what you said we will further look into other reaction time based uh, measures also uh, the age range uh, what is the range of ages of the participants in this the age range is uh, the training range is from 6 months to 37 years that right. my uh, but the age range is from uh, just a minute. Right. Uh, uh, the mean age is uh, 28 uh, years. So it ranges from uh, anywhere around 18 to 53 year olds. 18 to? 53. Right. So, and again, uh, one other issue that might come is that uh, the reaction times, the, right, the natural slowdown due to aging right that has to be also uh, controlled for right the the participants the older participants in your group may have a uh, uh, larger reaction time naturally because of the slowing down compared to right over and right, beyond right. Uh, the what stroop is exactly. trying to do yeah right so, so that is some stop, that we, we did not uh, no we uh, yeah uh, heard about intra-individual variability, right? right? Within the individual, again, there are variabilities, but what we are now talking about is age-related uh, possible differences that might also creep into this, right? That, yes, we did not look into that, but yes, that, that is definitely a very good point right. that we should control for in future work. Okay. Thank you, Aishwarya. Thank you, sir. Uh, Thank you, sir. Yeah, so the last presentation in this session is uh, uh, titled Contingency of the Capture, Conscious and Unconscious. Well, conscious or unconscious, I guess. Shivam Puri, Seema Prasad, and Ramesh Mishra from University of Hyderabad. A recorded video. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Do you remember anything? that tried to grab your attention lately? Well, there should be a few things. Because from billboards to advertisements and awareness campaigns, as soon as you step out of your home, there is a plethora of visual stimuli desperate to grab your attention. Mostly just to sell you something or to advertise something to you. But now the game has changed. There is a new player in the market and I like to call it portable connected screens. It includes all the devices that are connected with internet. For example, laptops, smartphones, etc. These devices are capable of capturing our attention consistently and efficiently. And why is that so? Because they use all the three components of attention capture whenever we are interacting with them. A classic example of that is my YouTube home screen present in front of you. Now, observing the strong influence of these portable connected screens on people around me made me curious about attention capture, specifically contingent capture, even more specifically contingent capture by unconscious stimuli. And that is what we are trying to investigate in this project. Our study is based on the seminal work by Folk et al, in which they gave the contingent capture hypothesis. To put it simply, a small silver object on your table will capture our attention if you are looking for your keys, but it will not capture our attention if you are looking for, let's say, your phone or wallet or something like that. Folk et al, in their third experiment of, this, of their study, 
demonstrated contingent capture for conscious absorbed onset cues and we are trying to check if the same exists for unconscious abrupt onset cues also and will compare it with the effect that folk at all got also the results from previous studies at our lab at university of hyderabad points to a fact that there should be a difference in capture by unconscious and conscious cues in this project we administer special queuing task on 80 participants across two experiments the task of the participant was to look for the target letter either e or h and press the corresponding key on the keyboard accordingly in experiment 1 the target is defined by its color that is one of the four letters in the placeholders will be colored red and the other three will be green participant had to look for this red colored letter and report its identity in experiment 2 the target was defined by its abrupt onset that is only one of the four placeholders will contain a letter participant had to look for it and report its identity by pressing the key e or h on the keyboard now the trial progression is as follows each trial starts with the fixation cross after 1000 milliseconds of fixation onset comes the queue display now Q is a brief stimuli which gives us a cue about the location of the target if it does that correctly it is said to be validly queued as we can see in this example that Q and target both are on the right side if it does that incorrectly it is said to be invalidly queued also in our experiment to keep the cues uninformative we kept the queue validity at 25% and queue duration for unconscious cues was set at 16.66 milliseconds and for conscious cues it was set at 100 milliseconds following the queue display came the placeholder display which contains just four circles in which the targets will appear later 33 milliseconds after the placeholder displays were the targets displayed for 100 milliseconds as soon as the targets are displayed the participant had to look for them and press the key accordingly so this is a self-paced experiment so the experiment will not move ahead until and unless the participant presses the key each participant was subjected to 10 blocks of 64 trials each eight of these blocks were dedicated to the spatial queuing task and then it was followed by two blocks of visibility test to check for the visibility of the queues now the visibility test was exactly similar to the main task with the only difference being the addition of a few catch trials here the participant was specifically instructed to not pay any attention to the letters and instead focus on the location of the cues and press up down left or right arrow keys accordingly and if they are not able to see the queue they should press space followed by this they were to rate their subjective experience on a pas rating scale which ranged from one to five where one means no experience of the queue and five means a clear experience of the queue now coming to the results in experiment one we observed significant queue validity effects whereas the effect of queue duration and the interaction between queue duration and queue validity was found to be not significant similarly in experiment two also we found significant Q validity effects, but the effect of Q duration was not significant, although the interaction between Q duration and Q validity was found to be marginally significant. So, what can we conclude from the results of the spatial queuing task? If contingent capture was to hold true, we should not have observed any valid validity effects in experiment 1 and we should have observed strong validity effects in experiment 2 
because in experiment one the q type and the target type are not matching we have an abrupt onset q with a color target whereas in experiment two both the q and the target are abruptly onset but what we have observed is that there is a significant validity effect in both the experiments now from this we can conclude that we did not find any significant evidence of contingent capture by abrupt onset stimuli or to put it in another way we can say that abrupt onset stimuli capture our attention in a stimulus driven manner to put it simply if there is a stimuli which comes suddenly at you or if there is something which occurs suddenly in front of your eyes it is definitely going to grab your attention no matter what you are thinking finally coming to the results of our visibility test it consisted of forced choice q location identification task the objective measure and the perceptual awareness scale rating the subjective measure both of them gave converging evidence that the cues behaved as they were expected to that is participants were able to clearly perceive the conscious cues and they were unaware of the location of unconscious cues this can be evident from the d prime values and the slider response ratings that are present in this table in front of you other than that we observed a strange disparity between the slider response ratings for valid and invalid cues for both conscious and unconscious cue durations now that is up to further investigation and that is our final question that we have to answer these are my references sayonara have a nice day uh, thank you shivam uh, for a nice presentation so uh, as what is uh, your the implications of this study in terms of uh, the models of uh, you know conscious uh, you know the capture co uh, contingent capture uh, there are existing models right uh, what does your study contribute to contradict or offer additional explanation mm -hmm. so right now from the results that we got from our study uh, it is more like we did not find any evidence for contingent capture by abrupt onset cues so it is sort of aligning with what lathrop and gasplin have told that uh, maybe abrupt onset cues are a class in themselves like we could have observed contingent capture if we would have used color cues but since maybe it is because we have used abrupt onset cues so they always capture our attention in a stimulus driven manner so maybe like it sort of aligns with that <clears throat> right now yeah and also uh, in terms of uh, the statistical analysis yes so some of these uh, you know for example the d prime scores and the slider scores that you are showing uh, the mean values right Mm, yes, uh, of course we do see that uh, there are quite a bit of difference in the in the different uh, trials but uh, uh, have you also verified the statistical significance of those uh, mm. say between the the trials where uh, the unconscious and versus the conscious conditions uh, i i only saw the numbers but uh, were statistical significant analysis also done to verify uh so within participant or between participant uh between participant between the groups between the groups uh yes sir so the last the table right you showed uh, this is the group result right the mean d prime uh, mean mm. slider yes sir right for different groups yes sir uh uh we do see that the values are different but uh, we 
cannot conclude anything from that right without doing a, a, some sort of a statistical test uh, yes sir i did two way anova test to confirm that uh, yes they were statistically significant okay right yeah uh, how about within participant variability uh, within participants sir i have not checked till now i'll do that right so do you think uh, there is uh, at least based on your uh, visual the feel for the data is there a lot of uh, intra individual within uh, yes, variability yes sir there is a lot of variability because of that only like there were some issues uh, so because... uh, what could be the source for this uh, of course i know that uh, 16.16 millisecond for the unconscious these are all quite uh, tough mm. experiments to conduct and Yes, sir. What could uh, be the source for this kind of variability? So, like uh, from the analysis of visibility test, what I can say is like uh, we got a hint from A prime values that some participants are biased. Like uh, during the unconscious trials, like they are in a more more conservative type of way. Like they'll be more happy to even say that the Q is not present when uh, when it is present. and right. even when uh, in the catch trials also they'll say no are not present because like they are very conservative so right. maybe that right. conservative bias is uh, leading to these results right okay yeah thank you very interesting study shivam and uh, seema is also on call thank you very much uh, and that comes uh, to the conclusion and i'm happy to declare we are right on dot uh, 6:45 I hand over hand over to the team back. Thank you, sir. Doctor Bappe, if I may add, uh, you uh, we have to learn a lot of things from the chair. But I can see that your past experience as a conference chair has been absolutely powerful. Thank you very much for chairing the session, Mahima. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, sir. That was really an extraordinary session, full of passion and endless knowledge. Thank you. Dr. Bappi Raju and Mr. Chaitanya, this marks the conclusion of the day one of the remarkable, memorable, and knowledgeable event, annual conference of cognitive science.